So nice to have this heat pump running. A really nice cool breeze in this 27 degrees weather. I bet you wish you had one of these in your garden right now, wouldn't you? External air conditioning, right? In this video I invite you to follow me along on a retrofit air source heat pump installation on a period property in South East London. I'll be explaining the thinking behind every single step of the process as we go along. So the first step of every air source heat pump uh, project should be heat loss. I measure all the walls, I measure the size of uh, all the windows, all the doors, measure all the radiators, I try to establish what the building materials are and what quality windows are and if there is any insulation to external walls, uh, ceilings, roofs or floor. So in here we've got four bedroom house, uh, it's a period property, 145 square meters or 1550 square feet for, for the feet people. Ah, that doesn't sound right, does it? By the way, the heat loss of this property is exactly 6.5 kilowatts. And when it's minus two, when it's 6.5 kilowatts of power, to be able to maintain 21 degrees inside. First floor has also been renovated to a very high standard. All external walls are insulated with 70 millimeters PIR insulation. You can see this lovely green roof on the kitchen extension uh, behind me right there. And you can see the glazing, triple glazed units as well. I mean, I think <laughs> the roof might need some attention actually. You just cut the grass on that roof with a lawn mower, do you? On the roof we've got 300 millimeters insulation which is excellent as well. I know that in my previous video that I'm gonna link here everyone loved those huge lovely radiators and I love them as well. Sadly at this property we can't do it. It's so well insulated that radiators are just your regular size. I mean this one is maybe a bit bigger but it still looks normal like a standard radiator right? This is where the external unit will go and we are digging a soak away. A four inch soil pipe will go in, surrounded by a uh, shingle. And then we have to run wiring and plumbing. Not that far actually on this job, just here to the utility room. And here inside we've got Phelan boiler, 200 liter unvented cylinder. We're not scrapping them though. They'll be moved to another house to the client's parents. That's a big plus that we can uh, use this relatively uh, new setup somewhere else and not chuck it in the skip. So I'm removing the boiler and what's kind of telling is that this is a 30 kilowatt boiler. We are replacing it with a unit that's five times smaller in its output, a heat pump that's uh, six kilowatts. And that boiler can modulate to six kilowatts. So the lowest output of the boiler is the same as the highest output of the heat pump. It just makes you think how grossly oversized uh, a lot of those boilers that we have in our houses are. So I'm assembling what's called a buffer. It has four connections on one side and two on the other. And it's like a big low loss header, 45 liters of water. And you can use it as a low loss header. And simply my return from central heating alone will go to the bottom one and then come on the other side on the top connection, back to the heat pump. And there's one T behind it before it goes to the heat pump coming back from the cylinder. So the buffer is only on central heating. I think I'm finally ready to put the cylinder in place. I'm just wiring the immersion backup heater because it's Friday, I haven't finished the heat pump yet. I still have controls to do and a tiny bit of pipe work. So I'm gonna wire a backup immersion so they have hot water here for a, for a weekend. And this cylinder has the most clever cable routing I've ever seen. Look, you put the cable here on the bottom, push it in and it should come out on, come out on top. No messy wires anywhere. It's really clever. Look. How cool is that? The unit will be connected on those not so flexible hoses. They are actually quite rigid. They are anti-vibration hoses, so basically when the unit runs, there's no vibration being transferred through the pipe or to the property because that could have be that could be noisy. And we also have two isolating valves on the unit on the back and what is called anti-freeze valves. Because you could use glycol on the system to prevent it for, for, from freezing. 
However, that lowers the output of the unit because it lowers the th uh, thermal capacity of water by quite a bit. So we don't want to sacrifice the output or efficiency and we are using antifreeze valves. They're just kind of valves that will open if the temperature drops to around three degrees. That's how antifreeze valve looks like they're from Kalefi and the water drips from this point here on the bottom. So we're putting them on in the lowest point. So I want them right here on the connection to the heat pump. So on the back, there are only two connections, flow and return, coming out right here from the heat pump. Behind the heat pump, we've got two isolating valves and then the cabling goes in between the pipe work. This pipe work will get insulated and we've got a high tough cable here for the main supply and a comms cable going next to it. So you get all the pipe work insulated, also going through the wall, you're ready to put a cover on this trunking now. My pipe work around the cylinder is completed and I have just the wiring to finish. And luckily it looks easy on Vyland Aerotherm. Much easier than on Daikin and much easier than on Grants that I've done before. The pipe work got a little bit busy right here, uh, but there's a lot of stuff we have to cram in in here. So yeah, three-word diverter, magnetic filter, uh, bypass for the system, uh, buffer. So yeah, it is a bit busy. One thing left to do as well is uh, reviewing underfloor heating manifold a bit. So, right here, we've got underfloor heating manifold with a pumping station and a uh, thermostatic mixing valve. Pumps no longer needed and that mixing valve's no longer needed because we will be running the whole system at the same temperature anyway. Blending valve and the pump is gone on the manifold. Just flow and return going to the manifold and we're gonna remove most of the actuators as well. How many leaks we gonna get? We already had one, my fault. That sounds ominous. Not like a church bell, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The pressure is almost one bar, already had a couple of leaks. Those connections are always tricky to do. You really want a flat face uh, female connection and a washer, not PTFE or stuff like that. But it looks like we are fine. Yeah, we're gonna get uh, Tom to power his heat pump for the first time. Okay, can we get three, two, go! So I have just gone through a installation assistant on this unit and I've got my uh, circulating pump on the unit on. We're purging the system of air. There's still loads of air and this here is just about enough space to get your hand there and leave it. I've just activated a test mode in a heating mode for the heat pump. So nice to have this breeze coming from the heat pump in this weather. And again, it's whisper quiet. You can't really hear that heat pump at all. It's just the air. My pipework is locked now. You have to lock all the pipework externally, internally, flows, all the returns, everything around the cylinder, including pipe or going in for hot water, for mains water, that all has to be locked. Should be locked on a gas boiler anyway, but you hardly see it locked because uh, we have not been caring about energy so much as we do these days. And I'm ready to power flush the system. Yes, we still power flush the systems on a heat pump installations exactly the same way you would have done on a new boiler installation. While the chemicals are running in the system, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna drop the trace heating element down to the soak away. It's the trace heating element going into my soak away. All I have to do is to find a bit of pipe to extend it down into my main soak away and that's it. So will this unit be cheaper to run than the gas boiler it replaces? I think it will and I don't only think it will, if my calculations are correct, it definitely will. Now the efficiency of those units is related to the difference of temperature outside and the temperature of uh, the water it heats up to, so flow from the heat pump. And the lower the difference uh, between external temperature and the flow temperature of the heat pump, the higher the efficiency. And we have something that we call a design temperature, so design flow temperature for the system. And if you look into the manufacturer specifications for this unit, if you can keep your flow temperature at 40 degrees at the, your design temperature of minus two, this unit will run at over 410% efficiency. And I've designed this system to run at 40 degrees C. 
If my calculations are correct, this unit should run at SCOP, which is seasonal coefficients of performance or average efficiency throughout the year, at over 400%. The unit that we removed was running on an S plan, and it was grossly oversized as well. Those setups are hardly ever more efficient than 80%. So if we were to divide the efficiency of this unit, estimated efficiency I must add, of 410%, by efficiency of the boiler we removed, so if you divide 410 by 80 or 81, you get over 5. So this unit is 5 times more efficient than the gas boiler we removed. Now obviously we have to uh, look at the difference in price between electricity and gas, and it's usually around 4. So electricity is kilowatt of electricity, kilowatt hour of electricity, it's around 4 times more expensive than kilowatt hour of gas. If it's five times more efficient than the gas boiler it replaces, it's going to be 21% cheaper to run. That's obviously all based on estimates and we'll have to wait till the winter to confirm their real life results. And I'm as curious as you are on how this setup will perform. And there'll definitely be a follow up video uh, in the winter or in January, maybe next year, where we will go exactly into all the figures and see how this unit has performed.